Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday of UC Love Data Week. We are excited to have you joining us um, today, and we're gonna we're gonna give it a minute. We know people sort of arrive to these a couple minutes after the hour. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. We are excited today to talk a little bit about Constellate, which is a fabulous resource that um, anyone has access to. So in the UCs, and it's a really helpful resource for getting started with text mining. And if you're here because you saw the JSTOR in the advertisement, that was not false advertising to lure you in. This is a way to use text mining on JSTOR content. So our wonderful guest speaker today is Amy, who is from Ithaca, and she is going to tell us all about Constellate and demo and talk a little bit about how to get started. So thank you, Amy, so much for joining us and go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. All right, I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Um, if I get going too fast, people feel free to slow me down. Um, we should have time for questions, so if you drop them in the chat, we'll try and get to them as they come up. If they start taking too long, I'll say, oh, just we're gonna hold on to them and get to them at the end. Um, it's it's wonderful to have so many of you here today to learn more about text analysis and uh, Constellate. I'm Amy Kirchhoff. Um, I've been with the Ithaca family of organizations for 25 years uh, doing this and that. Um, and I'm currently our Constellate business manager. In case you don't know, Ithaca is the organizational home of JSTOR, which you probably do know, and ArtStore, which you may know, Portico, which you probably don't know, but provides preservation services to the scholarly community, and Ithaca SNR, which provides strategy and research services to the academic community. So we're, we're in this big milieu of Ithaca. Constellate is a new, a new service from Ithaca, and it's a platform for teaching, learning, and performing text analysis. We developed Constellate because it's the Zetabyte era with estimates that the global data sphere ended 2021 at around 44 zettabytes and will hit 175 zettabytes in 2025. And in our world of overwhelming data inputs, information literacy skills, especially including text analysis, are required in all courses of study. So text and data analysis is needed for journalism, for search completion, to prioritize hacker mitigation strategies, to quickly focus on the core information in geological reports, to aid in President Biden's cancer moonshot. There's really no field in which text analysis is not a needed skill. Yet teaching text analysis is difficult. Students need to transition from interacting with point and click tools to working with code and statistics. And as complex as learning it can be, at an institutional level, building the infrastructure to make teaching text analysis easy is difficult. You have to build a platform that would scale and it requires ongoing technology support. And all of that is before all of these newly educated individuals are ready to do robust text analysis research, which is yet another challenge. Enter Constellate. Our focus is to help schools of all sizes and means teach text analysis, integrated into general humanities, social sciences, and STEM classes, as part of information literacy interactions at the library, and as standalone data science classes. We've tried to build a solution that's really centered on student and instructor success. So using Constellate, students at our schools may take classes taught by Constellate or classes taught by their school on the Constellate platform. They may also work through the Constellate tutorials on their own. Teachers at our schools may teach text analysis on the Constellate platform using tutorials we've written or tutorials and classes that they have written. Librarians can integrate text analysis into their information literacy curriculum. 
and constantly provides researchers with access to lots and lots of primary and secondary con content. And a pause in case there's any questions. This is a good, a good breaking point before we go play. All right, we'll go play then. This is the fun part anyway. Um, so we're gonna take a, a deep dive and look into Constellate. I encourage you to come play in Constellate with me right now. If you've got a couple of monitors, pop Constellate up on the other one. You can point your browser at constellate.org. Uh, before we begin, I'm gonna suggest you do two things. One is make sure you're on the UCSD network. If you're on campus or you're on a VPN, you should be all set. Um, this will let you work with all of our features because UCSD is trialing uh, Constellate at the moment. If you can't get on the network, that's okay. You'll be able to do lots of things, but you'll, you'll realize um, you won't be able to make it into the Constellate lab, but you'll be able to work with all the data sets. Um, the second thing I'm gonna uh, suggest you do is go ahead and log in at the top right. I'm gonna do that right now. This is gonna let us personalize your experience and it is required before you can work with data sets. Um, I'm gonna log in right now. I, I clicked login and you'll notice I bounced out to JSTOR. We uh, leverage the JSTOR auth and auth system. So you log into Constellate with a My JSTOR account. I find login with Google to be the easiest. Um, and so I'm gonna click on that and it's gonna happen. I'm gonna pick my work account and some magic happens. And you can see now that up at the top right, uh, my browser, my Constellate knows that I'm coming from a J J store, and it knows it's me. I can get to my dash, personalized dashboard. As a side note, once you use your my J store account while on a UCSD network, we'll remember that. Um, so if you go home and log in, even if you are on the network, we'll give you those UCSD privileges. So it, we, we kind of stick it to your user account for a little bit, I think it's three months or something. Um, so with, with the login stuff set aside, let's have some fun. I'm gonna do a search right here and we can do it right from the homepage. And I'm gonna pick a topic I care about, foster care. And um, you can see that I've dropped right into the Constellate data set builder. And I can go ahead and search by publication title if I cared. So for example, say I wanted to limit myself to titles with social work. I could come in and choose them. We do have a lot of uh, journal titles, so I might wanna uh, select them from a browse list and I could do that right here. I am gonna limit my publication date because I find that with this particular topic, anything pre-1950 is a little wonky, definitely outliers. Uh, I could limit my language if I wanted to. I, I happen to know that this data set's mostly English and I'm pretty good in English, so that's okay. Um, we do have other languages in there. There's a good amount of German. There's some um, Russian and French, some other European languages. Uh, we also have a, a fairly robust amount of content um, from South Asia. So you can encounter some Bengali and Hindi as well. Um, I'm interested for my purposes in secondary literature. So I'm gonna choose, limit myself to articles chapters and books. Um, I could throw in reports too, that's okay. Um, the newspaper content can be quite interesting. It's got content from Chronicling America, which is historic newspapers. Um, and it also has content from Reveal Digital. Reveal Digital is a, a JSTOR project where they partner with libraries to build collections that are really tight and, and kind of in really quite interesting. So we've got two collections right now in Constellate from Reveal Digital, um, American prison newspapers, and a collection I'm gonna forget the name of, but it includes um, both alt-left and alt-right content from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, it's actually really cool if you're coming in and just playing, if you go into Reveal Digital and pick a couple of the say feminist titles, you can get really interesting results right away because of this topic is so targeted. The content in those publications is so targeted. I could do filtering by provider. Um, I'm actually interested in, like I said, the secondary literature. So there's got the JSTOR and the Portico there. 
I could filter by category. These are categories that we've assigned at Constellate um, through a machine learning process. And we've assigned them to articles and books uh, and book chapters. So I could choose to filter based upon, upon those categories. And then finally, we identify content in Constellate in two ways. We, it's either rights restricted, which means we can provide users with non-consumptive data sets. Those are essentially data sets that you couldn't use to rebuild the full text for reading purposes. Or content is open, uh, in which case for the open content, we can, we'll just deliver the OCR full text to you right in the data set when you download it. Most of that content is pre-copyright. Although over the next few months, that should be shifting. JSTOR actually has a big project to try and figure out what is open within JSTOR. And when that reaches conclusion, that's data that will come to Constellate and we'll be able to make that content open as well. And um, we have recently uh, come to the legal decision that we are comfortable providing the Portico open access content as open in Constellate as well. So that all should open up um, the next month or two, I think. Um, so you probably noticed that as I was doing my filtering on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, my visualizations changed. Uh, if you've managed to get onto your network, you're going to be seeing five visualizations here. If you're not, you're probably just seeing two, um, a little bit of a benefit for folks who are participating. The first visualization here is a uh, distribution by publication year. Um, I happen to know that this is not an unusual curve for scholarly publication overall. Like there's been a massive increase in publications over time uh, and recently, and, and we've all sort of seen this growth in, in scholarship and, and outputs. Um, so if I'm curious about how this compares, I'm looking, this curve is just for my foster care data set. I'm actually gonna remove foster care and now I can see that for the 27 million or so uh, journal articles, book chapters from in the scholarly publications right now, that this curve is shallower. It's, it's more shallow than the one I was seeing with foster care. Um, I like to point this out because one of the things that's really important when you're doing text analysis and it um, can be challenging to grasp is that you have to take into consideration artifacts from your data, your data and how they're impacting you. And so you can use, if you're an instructor, you can actually help use Constellate to try and uh, show this. Like you have to be careful that um, the, the conclusions you are drawing aren't just conclusions that you could draw because it's scholarly literature as opposed to around the topic that you consider. Um, so there's actually something here about why the foster care uh, slope is a little bit different. I suspect it has to do with the terminology and that there's another kind of term used earlier, but I don't actually know. Could be a research project for somebody. Our second visualization is around key phrases. And these are significant phrases that we've pulled out of the content. So again, Constellate's done a machine learning process across all this content to identify these uh, key phrases. Uh, for those who've done text analysis before, we're actually using TFIDF to pull those out. Um, and so as you might expect, children uh, occurs in most of this literature. Um, we use our phrases, we do have some two word phrases. I don't think there's any three word phrases in here. Um, and so I can see how social work, the term social workers is uh, uh, in terms of the percentage of these documents that it's showing up in. Again, that's an interesting curve that interests me. And I wonder if it's a terminology thing again, if there's another kind of uh, terminology used now. I happen to know being a foster parent that um, we have a caseworker and a resource worker um, and they may in fact be social workers but those aren't the words they use. And so I wonder if that's impacting this but I don't know for sure. Someone could go do some research. Um, we have a term frequency viewer. So if you've ever used the Google Ngram viewer, that's what this is. So I'm gonna chart mother and father. And we can see that across this foster care data set that I'm building, the term mother is used in about 50% of those documents and the term father is used in about 30% of those documents. And it's, it's really consistent. And the differences between the two is really consistent. 
this is another case where I look at this and I want to go, I know I go, what does it look like across all of this literature as a whole? And so I'm just going to go up and remove foster care and take a look. And we can say it's quite different. In fact, um, while mother is used more frequently in scholarly literature as a whole, uh, at least starting from 1970 onwards, um, there's only a one point difference between the frequency of the term mother and the frequency of the term father. That might be interesting to investigate, but it's not nearly as dramatic um, as foster care. So there is in fact something about this literature, a scholarly literature about the, that references the foster care system where we're talking about mothers you know, 20% more frequently or 20 point spread um, than over, over fathers in this literature. Um, Ithaca is not gonna let me take six months and research this, but I would, I would love to. I'd love to take this and then compare it to case files. Um, does what we're seeing in the scholarly literature match the kind of um, verbiage and, and words we're using in case files? And then, you know, lay that against, to, uh, literature and research onto whether this is how problematic this is and um, uh, thinking about ways to, to, to resolve it overall. And, and at any rate, I think it's not gonna pay me for six months to go do this. So someone else should, I really think so. Um, those categories we talked about, we've got two charts next about them. The first one picks the, the five most frequent and does a nice distribution uh, by year uh, graph for them so that you can see how they, they, their assignment has changed over time. And then we have a tree map of uh, the entire corpus that we're looking at my full data set to see what's happening in terms of those category assignments. At the bottom, we do provide you with a list of hits. We're not a discovery service. So if you're coming to look for articles on foster care, it was probably not the right place to come. Um, however, it, this list provides a nice double check. So for example, if I thought I was building a data set about foster care and shelter animals, I would look at this and go, ooh, I have to go revise my search because I was clearly not narrow enough. Where possible, we link out to the content. So a lot of this content is from JSTOR, but we have some portico things showing up here. And if so long as we have a DOI, that's gonna to link to the content at the publisher. Portico actually can't do delivery of content. It is just a preservation service. I'm pretty sure this one's at Wiley. Let's take a look. Yeah, so Wiley is one of the publishers that's uh, agreed to have their content available through Constellate. So the next fun part is um, let's build. I'm gonna click build. Feel free to build yours. Go ahead, it. build out your data set, your, your dashboard. Um, <laughs> I've been demoing a lot the past couple of weeks. We've got a couple of them in here. Um, foster care demo. And from here, we're looking at my dashboard. I'm in Constellate all the time. So I've got a bunch of, a bunch of um, uh, content in here. Uh, I have some Hebrew content going on in here also um, and all sorts of, all sorts of things happening. Um, so each time I build a data set, it gets saved to my dashboard and I can come back and work with it. For every data set I've, we've built, you've built, I can, you can choose to visualize it. And that takes us to a nice stable page for the data set. So it's the same visualizations before, but there's just no filtering available. This provides you with a nice URL that you can share. So you could build the data set and share it with a class uh, um, if you're teaching or share it with your co-researchers if you're researching and you would be looking at the same, the same thing. Um, I could also choose to download. By default, what happens when you click build up at that top right is we're gonna build a 1500 item, two 1500 item sample files for you. One with just metadata and then one with metadata and a bunch of um, other con bits of information. You can come get the full thing and I'll show you how to click more download and do that. We do the 1500 item sample because what we found 
is that users, when you tell them they can create a 50,000 item data set, they, pick, pick, uh, they build a 49,999 item data set. And then especially for new users who are coming in to learn, this is really frustrating because it takes a while to run through 49,999 items and count things. So for learning purposes, the sample works really well. Um, it also means we're not spending resources building files people don't ever really need. But if you need more, you can come on in and uh, come to more download and build uh, more, more data sets and more content. Um, you can get all sorts of different kinds of versions of the data set, including one that is everything we have to offer. Now, I think, let's flip back to this. We talked a little bit about non-consumptive data sets earlier. Um, and that is what we've got, what you're, what you're downloading there for the most part. So these are data sets where a user couldn't recreate the text of the article for reading purposes. We apply this concept of non-consumptive to all of our rights restricted content. However, for open content, you're gonna get the full text right in, if you download that JSON file, you'll get the full text of all of the open content. All of our data sets include bibliographic metadata, unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams. Unigrams are every unique word in the doc, each document and the number of times the word occurs. Bigrams are every unique pair of words and the number of times the pair occurs. For example, Jack and Jill went up the hill. Jack and is a bigram that occurs once, and Jill is a bigram that occurs once, and so on. We are always on the hunt for additional kinds of non-consumptive data sets and welcome suggestions. For example, when working with a researcher, we discovered um, <laughs> discovered we discovered a non-consumptive data set based um, on sentences. And what the user does is they build a data set. Uh, across the topic they care about, foster care in this instance, um, and then send us a pattern or a regular expression to match. And we pull all the full sentences out that match that pattern. Um, and so the first researcher who used this was someone who was interested in all the sentences across performing arts journals that contain the word experimental. Um, and so long as the number of sentences we're giving you is less than 10% of the article, we'll just, we'll just do that and hand it over and it's a CSV file that you can, you can download. This is an example of a, non a different kind of non-consumptive data set. And it's, I like to share it because we're always looking for other kinds um, so that we can try and help researchers uh, uh, as much as we can before we have to get to the legal agreement stage of, yeah, we're gonna provide you with content, but here are the rules and regulations around it. Um, that it happens outside of our standard TNC. So um, we can also provide the full text of JSTOR content upon request. That does require a form. We review the form um, and in conjunction with our legal department, decide if it's something we can just fulfill or if perhaps we need a researcher agreement or we have to tweak the content being requested. But that is a, that is a possibility. Okay, so we've talked download um, and uh, you're welcome to come in here and download the full thing of any of these bits. Uh, it's going to take about an hour or two to build. So these are big, these can be really big files, something to remember if you try and download them. Um, so if you request one, give it a couple of hours to finish, you come back and you'll be able to download it. So you can see I've, I've previously built the Bigram CSV for this one. And so it's available and ready for me to download. Um, those get cached for a couple of months. Um, if you did it once and you come back six months later and you're like, oh, it's not there anymore, just build it again and it'll, it'll build, it'll be the same file as before. So we've talked about um, uh, visualize and download. The other thing you can do from right here on your dashboard is analyze. And I'm gonna open up our word frequencies notebook Amy, can I actually uh, interject momentarily yes, uh, so that we do have some people that are not from UCSD on on the call or maybe watching. Um, okay. So 
everything we've done so far, um, with the exception of some of those cool extra like tree map visualizations, anyone right. can do, anyone can download, anyone can build. That's exact, then, exactly right. Okay, fantastic. I want to clarify. Yep. So anyone can download, um, you can go and use that data. And then what is going to be demoed now is these sort of extra bells and whistles. Um, and UCSD happens to be to be beta testing this. And uh, yeah, so just wanted to clarify, yep, if that's you're good. at a different UC, you might not be able to access this at the moment, but you can access everything else and build your data set and download it. I um I didn't realize when we started this that it was a broad UC system, um, which is fantastic. If you see something in here that you're really excited about, reach out to me or to your library, and we'll work with them. Um, we're doing a, we're we're offering a, a semester long trial right now for folks for institutions to run to really kick the wheels, um, and that gets people into the Constellate Lab, which is what we're going to take a look at now, and also able to take some of the classes that we teach at. at constantly and really give people a sense of whether they're ready to do some of the the teaching that comes that that you can do on constantly whether they're just ready to embrace that what's happening right now is we're opening up a jupiter notebook in the constellate lab the um constellate lab is jupiter running in the cloud so it's completely in the cloud one of the real benefits of of building this ecosystem of data set building, easily moving into actual in-depth analysis in the cloud is that we really like, we think it's important that text analysis be integrated right into regular classes. And if you're, if you're a history professor teaching History 101, you cannot spend an hour and a half setting up everyone's computer. Like, you, um, you know, if that is the bar you have to cross before you can even start teaching text analysis, it's a non-starter. So we were really trying to build an environment that lifts everyone up so that they can write and get started. And if you, if you decide after working in the Constellate Lab for a couple of months, you're like, I'm committed, I'm, you know, and you need to work with really big files and you're ready at that point to, to learn how to do some of that locally. But we wanna make it possible for everyone to get in and start doing work. It also makes it a lot easier to teach. Um, if you're uh, teaching a class of 20 people, you know, everyone's on the same page, you're all at the same place, um, we're not running into difficulties saying I can't, I can't, um, you know, my computer has authentication issues and I can't, I'm not allowed to install software. Uh, so this is all running in the cloud. It's going to scale. So if we're a class of 40 hitting it, or if we're all hitting it right now, everyone's going to be able to get in. Um, we do have to spin up additional AWS nodes. So if it might take you more than a couple of minutes, that's okay. It shouldn't take more than five or six to, to spin up those nodes in the background and get you running. We're looking at a Jupyter notebook here. This happens to be a really nice way to package together code, documentation, and data. And data science instructors actually use these a lot for teaching purposes. There's, uh, and there's in fact a couple of journals where you publish, you don't publish an article, you publish a Jupyter notebook, it's really cool. The language, we're looking at Python right now, that's the language we've got um, in this particular notebook and all of the Constellate Jupyter notebooks right now are in, are in Python. It's really straightforward to come in and run and start doing analysis. Um, it's this data set is configured to look, or this notebook is configured to look at my data set because I came into the lab from a data set. By default, it's working with one of those 1500 item samples, my 1500 item sample for my data set. We provide instructions in here to explain to you how to change that. Um, so you can work in the notebook space with your full data set. Um, note that things may take a while. Uh, and be sure to build your data set before you try and run it in the in the in the uh, notebook. Because um, if you run that little bit in the notebook before you've built the data set, it'll tell you, well, it's nothing for me to grab. What we're doing right now, this is our word frequencies notebook. Um, and so we're going to try and find all of the unique words in my foster care data set um, and how frequently they occur. 
uh, well, across my 1500 item sample. And so we just pulled, we just ran some code that pulled all of those unigrams out of my data set. And now we're gonna get some results. So really exciting. Let's see what we've got going on. And really disappointing. That's not helpful at all. Um, I've got a bunch of function words. I've got the in here twice, once with a capital. So if I was hoping to get results here, um, I'm, I'm disappointed. I like to show this notebook because it, it really I, uh, highlights the tutorial-based nature of our notebooks. So the next paragraph in this notebook says, that wasn't successful, was it? And what's beautiful about this is that's true no matter what. I could have built a data set from the SAWA, the South Asian Open Archives Collection. And this would be a list of Bengali and Hindi function words. I wouldn't recognize them, but they would all be function words. Um, and so the notebook now says, you need to do a couple of, you need to do some cleanup on this data. So we need to, we need to throw out all of those function words that happen to be grammatically important, but really aren't intellectually important to your content. And, and let's lowercase everything because so those two thes get hooked up together. Um, and so we now describe, we're gonna load in a stop word list, which is a list of common words to throw out. And we don't have to build one. There's one that exists. We'll go grab it from NLTK and let's take a quick look at what's in it. And we have a bunch of, um, so these are the words, some of the words we're gonna throw out. And then we have a nice section that say, explains that like, it, this might not be sufficient for your purposes. So if you need to come in and modify it, have at it. This is how you're going to do that. These are the commands you're gonna issue. And now we're gonna gather all those unigrams again. And this time you can see I'm lowercasing everything. If I've got my, if my unigram is in that list of stop words, I'm gonna throw it out. Um, if it's got non-alphabetical characters in it, I'm gonna throw it out. If it's four characters or less, I'm gonna throw it out. One of the real beauties of this environment is that you can, um, you can modify it. This is interactive. I might look at this and go, ooh, I know there are some four character words in my data set that I'm interested in. They're really important in this field of study. And I could come in and change this and then run it. And this time I would throw out things that were three characters or less, but I'd be capturing my four character words. Uh, now let's take a look. Let's print it out again and see what we've got going on. And that's much better. I'm happier with that. <laughs> um, so the top 25 words. So on the, this is interactive front, I wanna see the top 50 now. And there you go, now I can see the top 50. I'm gonna go ahead and do the next little bit here in this notebook, and I'm gonna write out my words to a CSV file. And I'll show you at the end how we can download that because it's a nice way to show how, how the space moves backwards and forwards. Um, we've also got a nice visualization here. So I am going to, we're gonna build a word cloud based upon my data set and our terms. Um, and there's some descriptions in here about how if you don't want a cloud, you want a different shape that you can put them in and use a different shape. So I now have an image um, of the very common words uh, in my foster care data set. You can see actually here also is pretty big. If I were going to do this for real, I would go back in and edit that stop word list. I'd add also, I'd add among, which is one I saw in here too, and some other things. Um, so we print, we made that CSV file. I'm going to come over to file open. And this opens me up into a directory. Uh, you'll actually see there's a lot of notebooks in here. You can run any of these. I'll show you another way to get into some of them also, but you're welcome. Any of these will run right here. Um, but I happen to know that my CSV file is in my data directory. So I'm going to download it. And I'm going to open it up. So I could have created the CSV file. Where did it go? There it is. Um, for my data set, use the Jupyter notebooks that exist to create a list of the most frequently used words output it to the CSV file. I can now point Tableau at the CSV file and do additional visualizations on it or do more math on it here, right in Excel if I want it. 
So the environment is very fluid in that way. We're really trying to build a nice ecosystem where you can really easily move back and forth from the data set builder into the lab, out to your own environment and back in again. If I happen to have notebooks locally on my computer, I could just upload them here. So I could click upload and load in a Jupyter notebook that I wrote, not one that Constellate wrote and run it here. And we'll see a couple of other ways that we can get other notebooks in, in, in here to run. Um, all right, let's see where we are. Okay, now we bounce back to, um, so we've seen a couple of paths through um, come back here. What we're missing now is another path through our environment is uh, through the tutorials and the classes. So you could start with building a data set like we did, but it may be that you're coming in and you're really early. Like we know there's people who hit those Jupyter notebooks and go, no, I'm out. That's too much. For those kind of people, we have built and uh, getting started with Jupyter Notebooks notebook. So you don't have to know how to hit run. All you have to know is to scroll. You can work through the tutorial on your own. It will teach you about run. Um, uh, all of these open up in our Constellate lab as well. The other path through Constellate is classes. So Constellate teaches two to four classes a semester, and we're gonna increase that number. We're actually gonna post a job description soon. Um, so if you're interested in teaching for Constellate, feel free to reach out to me and we can talk. Um, so this is, I'm showing just a list of some of the classes that we, we, we run, and it's a list we intend to continue to grow over the course of the year. Uh, you can also run your own classes. So uh, if Stephanie or Annalise wanted to run a class, they could do that. Um, if you noticed, one of the options in Analyze at the bottom is use my own notebook. You can use this to just point um, Constellate at an existing GitHub repository. So let me grab a URL here. I have um, a URL to a named entity recognition class run um, by Zoe LeBlanc at our last um, tap into tap, ta text analysis pedagogy institute in the fall. So she wrote a series of notebooks um, uh, to teach about named entity recognition. And let's open up intro to NER. So this is the one I want. I'm gonna come back here. Um, and what we've got going on here is I've now built this little app, I guess we'll call it an app, has built me a URL to run Zoe's notebook in the Constellate lab. So if I were teaching and I had my own GitHub repo, um, I could build this URL and have, hand it out to all of my students and have them open up my notebooks right in, in the Constellate lab. And we have some participating institutions who do this when they teach. They've, they've sort of taken some of Nathan's notebooks, modified them, tweaked them, put their own in, and they run their own classes right here in Constellate using the Constellate lab. Doesn't even have to use Constellate data. Um, so those are the those are our paths through. And those okay. So there's a couple of URLs. We don't need those. We just took a look. Um, I will say while we're on the GitHub uh, spot, um, the Constellate notebooks are all out in GitHub. You are welcome to come fork them. You could download them from there. Work with them locally if you want to run them in Anaconda on your computer, that's just fine. You can fork them and, and go have fun with them. They are all publicly available with the CC by license. What's next? I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview of what we've got coming up. Uh, right now, the Constellate user dashboard just contains data sets. And we're moving really rapidly to a place where your data dashboard can be used to save not just your data sets, but also your code. So when you're working on a research project or teaching a class, 
you tend to compile a bunch of files. You've got data sets and notebooks and supporting data. Um, you've got outputs and all of that accumulates. And right now you either have to keep all of that locally on your computer or out in GitHub. But in the next iteration of the Consolate dashboard, we'll provide a place where you can collect all of those necessary files together in a, in a folder right in Constellate. So if you're an instructor, you can build everything you need for your class within Constellate and then just share that folder with others by emailing them the URL and they'll get their own copy. We're really excited about this. Um, we're user testing it right now just to make sure we aren't off our rockers, but we think it'll be pretty game changing for our instructors and our researchers. And that's it, I'm done, I'm out. Um, thank you for spending time with us today. I'm happy to answer questions. You can pop them in the chat. I'm comfortable getting on mic and asking them. I don't know if that fits the UC model here. Um, before closing out, if you wanna stay in touch with what we're doing, feel free to join our um, email group. It's open to anyone and uh, that's where we'll post announcements and alerts. And there's some little bit of analytics chatter on there, not too much. I'm open to questions. Thanks, Amy, that was fantastic. Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to go ahead and raise a hand and unmute or throw it in the chat if you'd like. Um, while people are absorbing <clears throat> the absolute coolness of, of Constellate, um, I'm also going to note that we did record this demo and it will be available on the UC Lib Data Week website because I, for one, will be going back and reviewing it. This was a fantastic overview. Um, and to recap as well, if you're at UC San Diego, we are beta testers for the lab. So feel free to play with it. It's a, it's a really fun interface. Um, if you're at the other UCs, you can still build and download a data set. All of the teaching notebooks are available on the public GitHub. So you can download them, you can use them and explore. So I'll pause. Um, I know I was getting some um, individual messages by people saying, this is fantastic. Is it gonna be recorded? So I can send it to people to convince them that it's amazing. Uh, and yes, it, it is, and you, you were able to. Um, so if there are no immediate questions, I'm going to assume people are, are soaking it in. It's a lot of information in the fact that the first time I saw Constellate, I thought I have so, so many ideas. The same as Amy was saying of, you know, UC San Diego is not going to let me take six months off to go um, explore this, but it would be fun too. So we do have a question. Um, are JSTOR books available? Hi, David. Um, the answer is, um bifurcated. So um, most of JSTOR is included. Uh, uh, nearly all of the journals with the exception of one. Our books agreements are a little bit different contractually. And so JSTOR open access books are in Constellate. And we are working to bring the other JSTOR book publishers in by way of a portico agreement. Um, because our Portico license agreement, they have to opt in. Our Portico publishers choose to opt in. Whereas our JSTOR publishers, uh, we have an interpretation of our, our agreement, which says that we can just include their data, except for these special books guys. So we are, we are working to bring them in. A good chunk of the JSTOR uh, uh, non-OA books are in, for example, where we just signed Princeton University Press. They happen to have books in JSTOR, they are non-OA they just signed their Portico agreement and we're literally piping their content into Constellate right now. So it's a, it's a, bit, of a, it's a bit of a mix. Um, if you have specific books or um, publishers you're interested in, let me know. You can also look up participating publishers. Hold on, if I come out to help and do, do, do not data set, content, Constellate content sources. And so we have a page here that describes who each of these providers are, because we know like people, we say Portico, they don't know what we're talking about. We say Doc South, that's not. But you can see um, uh, what's, in, uh, what's in and what Portico publishers are participating. We are looking to increase the number of Portico publishers this year quite significantly uh, is our goal. I hope that helps. You're welcome. 
Yeah, that was a, a great question. So we're looking forward to seeing even more books available yeah. for, for analysis. Um, so I'll pause one more time for any other questions. You can also email Amy directly. Uh, her email is, is on there. So if there are no other questions, I just want to reiterate, thank you, Amy. This was fantastic. Uh, I got re-excited about all the things to do. I need to find a spare spare six months to go explore all the things right. I want to do. I know. <laughs> I know. That's the I dangerous know. part. <laughs> Every time I play with it, I'm like, oh, there's another research project I could go do. <laughs> Writing down ideas on my little notepad as I was watching this going, oh, thought? No, no, I gotta, <laughs> gotta focus. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for attending. And hopefully we'll see you at other UC Love Data Week events. Enjoy your, enjoy your week of data. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.